Hi, I'm Jeff Watts and welcome to another episode of Jeff's Top 10 Tips. This episode is about distributed agile teams and is in response to the request by Dorothy Beecroft, who left a comment after the last Top 10 Tips video. I think I might try that as a new tradition going forward. So the first person to like and comment on this video gets to choose what the topic is next time. Let's give that one a go. In this video, we're going to talk about what the benefits of distributed teams are, the downsides of distributed agile teams, and 10 things that you can do to improve things with your distributed teams. Well, what is a distributed team, first of all? Well, for me, a distributed team is a team where not everybody's in the same physical location. In the early days of distributed teams, in the early days of Agile, in fact, um, they got a bad rap simply because a lot of organisations took the opportunity to try and offshore a lot of their work to the cheapest possible area they could find. It's where a lot of the stigma came from. So there are some common misconceptions. One is that in order to be agile, you have to have a co-located team. Well, that's not the case. Uh, personally, I've been involved in lots of teams that are spread across different countries and been able to, to use Scrum. They've been able to, to be very agile. Some people point to the Agile Manifesto and say, well, one of the principles is face-to-face -face communication. And it is, um, but it just says the best form of communication, the most efficient and effective form of communication is face-to-face. -face. Now, while I would imagine a lot of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto would probably agree that co-located teams are generally more effective, as would I, it doesn't say that you have to be physically co-located. <laughs> Distributed teams generally get a bad rap, but they're not all bad, and there are some clear benefits to having people in different parts of the world. Um, firstly, we get greater coverage so we can use the, the time zone difference to our advantage as one part of the team or perhaps one team is finishing up their day, another team is starting and perhaps we can hand over that work for more continual development. In terms of coverage, we've also got access to more people, more quality people. We can fill the team with the best people, regardless of where they are, rather than just the people who are physically in our geographical area. And that will also give us greater diversity. So we can have people from different cultures, different perspectives, different backgrounds, which will allow us to make more rounded, holistic decisions and avoid things like groupthink. So there are a few benefits to having distributed teams. So what are the main downsides to distributed teams? Well, the main one really is in the, is in the words that we chose there, distributed teams. Not a lot of the distributed teams that I've seen or been part of actually feel like a team. They're not as close together. They don't get to look each other in the eye. They don't get to, to feel connected to one another. They don't have the rapport of a team. And so, so given the choice, most people would probably like to work in a team where they could see the people they're working with. Not always, but mostly. What is this? Happy holidays, Dwight. But do not open it till Christmas. So generally morale is lower and issues take longer to resolve. Uh, things drop between the cracks more often and people leaving it to one another and not really knowing who's doing what and where the responsibilities are. Uh, so there's more dependencies and less collaboration. As well as all that, there are the time zone issues. Um, generally, there's going to be little overlap the more distributed you are. So that limits the, the opportunity for actually working together on things uh, and and separates us into smaller groups uh, and, and we tend to focus the work then into areas or patches or batches that individuals can do rather than the team can do. It's not impossible but it does make things more difficult. So here are a few tips for what you can do to help make things a little bit better. At 10, our first tip is to not use it as an excuse. What do I mean by that? Well, pretty much every team these days is distributed to some degree. Even, 
even teams where everybody is in the same building quite often are at different parts of the building or different floors and they'll have flexible working hours uh, people working from home quite a lot so every team has some degree of distribution and disbursement so there's no real opportunity to say well we can't be agile because our team's all over the place in an ideal world we probably would have a co-located team um, but we're probably not in an ideal world so given that this is the case that we find ourselves in would i rather use an agile approach or a more traditional approach and i would always go for the more agile approach because it kind of forces collaboration it reduces the amount of time that things can go wrong and people can not talk to each other because at least at the end of every iteration we're going to have to collaborate and see where we are and get some feedback uh, and talk to one another so an agile approach allows us to make the best of that situation it's an easy excuse to put in there um, but it doesn't really help and this idea i've said this in a few of my videos before whether you believe you can or believe you can't you're probably right and this idea of getting into our heads that we can't do this because so and so is in a different country means we're generally going to be looking for evidence that backs up that view that confirmation bias so you can't use that as an excuse anymore it's about making the best of the situation and working out ways to make the best use of your time and the people in your team at nine my suggestion is to co-locate as much as you can so perhaps rather than having two teams where they're both split over locations have two feature teams that one is in each location if you can't do it by team then then co-locate by triads or pairs or something like that so we, there is some element of uh, co-location at some point some some aspect of direct collaboration all the time that's probably going to be better than having two feature teams split across both those locations and if possible make use of that uh, somewhat provocative term that's come into the, the lexicon of promiscuous pairing so rotate people around for a period of time you know, two weeks working with this person two weeks working with that person that will help spread the knowledge spread the awareness spread the understanding and the empathy build those connections that rapport and build up that sense of team identity and culture that's going to be a little bit harder to do in a distributed team tip eight is assume positive intent what do you mean by that i hear you ask in general i find the best teams uh, give each other the benefit of the doubt. They, they, they work on the assumption that everybody is trying to do a good job. They would like to do a good job. I don't know many people that come to work wanting to sabotage the team, the organisation, their colleagues. However, the, the, the less frequently you see people, the further apart you are from them, the harder it is to think favourably of them. We generally interpret their actions slightly less positively if we haven't seen them for a while uh, and so it could be that we need to just kind of force ourselves with a prompt now and again of thinking right this didn't go quite as I would like if I were to give them the benefit of the doubt how would I interpret that I think that's quite a helpful thing to do for a team so assume positive intent uh, and consciously thinking from a positive interpretation will make those interactions and the, the sort of bumps in the road that a distributed team is inevitably going to come across a little bit easier to tolerate. Tip seven is get together when you can. This is about getting everybody together and as often as you can. Most important times for getting people together are the high bandwidth ceremonies. So things like team kickoffs, sprint kickoffs, sprint reviews, sprint retrospectives. You're going to have such benefits from that in terms of team dynamics, in terms of rapport, in terms of understanding. It's, it's a great way to build that sense of, of team and common ownership and, and, and peer accountability. Obviously budgets are going to be a challenge. Find out what you can, get as much as you can and then use it. it in my experience, it's never a wasted investment. Tip six is to promiscuously pair and particularly around reviews. Make sure we're not reviewing our own work, but also make sure we're not reviewing on our own. Whatever level we're talking about, 
Make sure we're not doing it on our own. If we can review together, that's much, much better feedback and increases that sense of understanding and empathy and shared perspective and create a common culture within the team over time. So rather than I'll do my bit, pass it over to somebody else and they review it, pairing as much as you can and then pr promiscuously pairing that term of just sharing the, the pairings around, making sure we all get to work with each other uh, and we don't develop little cliques or sub teams. Tip five is to agree collaboration times. Now I actually, I, I, I recommend this for teams that are co-located as well. As I've already said, every team is distributed to some degree. Agile teams are often quite noisy. And that's a good thing, okay? We swarm around a problem, we, we see what's going on, we hear each other's opinions, we're collaborating directly. But that can be quite distracting when you really just want to get your head down and do something. Even the best agile team, even the most agile teams will have quiet time. And so the conversation is then around, well, when is the quiet time and when is the collaboration time? Now in a distributed team, that might be less opportunity around that because there may only be a certain amount of time when there is overlap and the possibility for communication and collaboration. Uh, and perhaps we, we can flex our, our working schedules a little bit in, in, lot, in every, every direction to increase that overlap as much as possible. And the rest of the time can be our own time, but we'll agree sort of interfaces for what we need to hand off to one another as our time zones then split. So tip four is invest in tools. Uh, it might be higher if it didn't make me feel so old. Now, why does that make me feel old? Because I start, I find myself starting to say things like, when I was first doing Scrum, we didn't have Slack and we didn't have Skype. There was no Facebook, there was no iPhone. I know, there was a world before all this stuff, kids. We had to make it work with rudimentary tools. Um, and that's where people start looking at me and thinking, Jeff, you're, you're an old man. Um, but it's true. And we, we, we did make it work then, even with, with terrible tools. I mean, terrible conference call hardware and, and, and software. So teams these days probably don't appreciate the technology and the tools that they have, even free. Um, or very cheap webcams and iPhone apps and tools and websites and services out there these days that tools can use. Freudian slip there. That teams can use to increase their collaboration and actually re reduce that feeling of being spread apart. Investing in tools to enable the team, and that's important, enable the team. We don't want to burden the team with a tool that's going to drag them down with bureaucracy and admin but actually enable the team to collaborate as well as possible then that's you're going to see the returns on that in terms of collaboration quality morale that sense of team that we were talking about very rarely do i see investment in tools being wasted money tip three is to over communicate basically be prepared to run the risk of sounding repetitively annoying. Uh, the temptation is to just do the bare minimum because communication is a bit harder when we're distributed. In general, the tendency in distributed teams is to under communicate, not consciously, and we kind of make assumptions that other people have got the same interpretation. We've all misinterpreted an email, okay? And the more distributed the team is, the more we rely on things like email. So over communicating things, spelling things out at the risk of sounding patronizing, repeating things at the risk of sounding annoying is generally a good thing to do. It's much better than under communicating. When we've made a decision as a team, let's over communicate that. Let's reinforce that. Let's make sure we're all aware of it and we haven't forgotten it. If we've got some standards as a team, that's another good thing to over communicate because we need to get into disciplined habits because we don't have the opportunity to look each other in the eye and, and review things a lot more informally and, and organically as we would if we were sitting next to each other. And the third thing, which is kind of tied to standards, that I think it's important to over communicate is the definition of done. Whatever that means at a feature level, uh, perhaps even at a task level, perhaps at an individual level, what our interfaces are between people, if we have any handoffs within the team, it's really important to overemphasize those rather than underemphasize those. Tip two is to learn about each other. Now, I'm a big fan of this 
regardless of how distributed the team is. All the best teams that I've seen know each other as people as well as colleagues. That, that builds rapport and a sense of accountability and says, I care about this person. You know. uh, but it's even more important than a distributed team because it's very easy to be just a name rather than an actual person, just a, a resource rather than an actual human being. So knowing a little bit about who we are, I'm going to know what annoys you as well. And I can use that to help build a relationship and build a successful team that I want to be part of. And building in a little bit of just personal time, perhaps into our days and our, perhaps our conversations. So it's not just all about work. Again, that, that can be seen as a cost, but for me, it's an investment. And tip one, my number one tip for distributed agile teams is to create some working agreements. Coming together and agreeing well, what kind of team do we want to be? And what does that mean for us? Uh, how, how are our individual values lining up here? So working out what we're prepared to do as individuals to, to make that team that we would like to be part of, what we're prepared to commit to each other to make that happen, what we need from each other to make that happen. And of course, we'll make mistakes, we'll forget things, but we can have positive intent. And remember that nobody's deliberately trying to screw up. We go again and we'll get better. So a quick summary of my top 10 tips then. Don't use it as an excuse. Almost every team is distributed to a degree. Co-locate as much as you can. Assume positive intent. Get everyone together when it's possible. Promiscuously pair around reviews. Agree specific collaboration times. Invest in tools. Over communicate decisions and standards. Learn about each other and draft working agreements. So that's the end of my top 10 tips video on distributed agile teams. Like I said, the first person to like and comment on this video can pick the topic for the next top 10 tips video. I hope you found it useful. And until next time, take care.